The Fake Controversy, New Revised Expanded Version by Dirk Anderson, an investigation into the teachings of Ellen White's Great Controversy. Setting the Captives Free. Preface. The preface of the 1886 edition of Great Controversy clearly states that, apart from the Bible, this book presents the most wonderful and interesting history of this dispensation to the complete restitution of all things that has ever been published. Without giving credit to any other source or author on this earth, it goes on to say, We believe that the writer has received the illumination of the Holy Spirit in preparing these pages. The Christian experience of the author has been truly remarkable. From her childhood, she was noted for her reverence and devotion and her love for the Word of God. And we believe that no one who knows what it is to hold communion with our Heavenly Father will fail to realise that the writer of these pages has drawn from the heavenly fountain and received help from the sanctuary. End of quote. In the light of those claims, we have taken that early edition that does not give human credit to anyone and traced where each chapter, paragraph and sentence has come from. With the underlining we have done showing where all the copywork has come from, we have also underlined the Bible texts used. One can see that there is no room left for God to work his will or way on Ellen's mind unless we create a concept of that God that we have never had and few would be willing to accept. She was a human being and as such did what humans do in her position with her human knowledge. She copied what she wrote from others as all the proof shows. Any human being, atheist, non-believer, scholar, could and has done the same as she has done. Indeed, some of those scholars did help her in the forming of the great controversy, but did not claim the same contact with God that she did. If one were to take the time, and some of us have, it can be shown and has been proven that Ellen was influenced and driven by the books she read, and was inspired by whatever vision others she copied from had. There is no evidence whatsoever in this world that God endorsed, approved or influenced her to copy what she copied. If we claim such, then we make God himself a liar. In the light of this and other research on Ellen's works, is it not time that we accept the fact that Ellen did not get any special vision or help from God directly or otherwise for what has been handed to the world as help from the sanctuary and heavenly fountain above? If we would say that she was impressed or influenced by what she read, and was a very human being speaking for her time and place in history, we might save what good she and her helpers did. If not, we only continue to create a false prophet when her sayings have been proven wrong and tie her to a God that is too human to believe as an eternal God. Walter Ray Introduction The year was 1994. I parked my car outside of an apartment building. I hopped out and strode briskly up to the front door of an apartment and knocked. The door opened a crack and a white-haired lady stared out suspiciously at this young man in a white shirt and dark tie who was thrusting a book towards her. Here is the book you requested, Mum, I said. Thanks, she half mumbled and extended her hand. God bless you, I smiled and headed back to the car. That year, I handed out over a thousand free copies of Ellen White's Great Controversy. It all started two years earlier when a small group of young, zealous Adventist men got together and decided to share the truth for the end times in our city in Florida. At our own expense, we mailed out 110,000 small flyers offering a free copy of Ellen White's Great Controversy. Why? We were absolutely convinced this book contained God's final warning message to the world. Our goal was to give lost souls, that is, non-Seventh-day Adventists, an opportunity to read this heaven-sent warning. Yes, I was Adventist to the core. It was not uncommon for me to attend historic SDA meetings, carrying my Bible in one hand 
and the new illustrated great controversy in the other hand. I believed what SDA pastors and teachers whom I trusted had taught me, that Ellen White was a prophet of God and her writings were just as inspired as the Bible. They reverently referred to her books as the spirit of prophecy and good Adventists did not question them. I felt privileged and awe-inspired to be part of the only true church, one with a modern prophet through whom God instructed his people. I was living my life inside a bubble built by well-intentioned folks. I grew up attending SDA schools and they indoctrinated me over and over again into what they called the truth. I learned that all other denominations were Babylon and apostate Protestantism. They told me that folks in those fallen churches would one day persecute and try to kill me for keeping Saturday as a day of worship. Thus I grew up in my bubble with a strong suspicion of anyone on the outside. All that changed one day when a man named Dale Rutzlaff convinced me to examine the writings of Ellen White with an open mind. I have since spent over 20 years researching Ellen White. During that time, the truth penetrated my mind. The illusion I was living under faded away as I discovered the reality of biblical truth. As I started looking at the bright light of the Bible, the lesser light faded into nothingness. If you are afraid of the truth, put this book down right now and never open it again. Because after you read this book, you will understand the awful truth and the terrible deception practised in the making of great controversy. Brother Anderson. Chapter 1. Who inspired Ellen White? A brilliant idea for a book was born in 1858. The concept was to paint a panoramic view of human history in order to illustrate the great controversy raging between good and evil. This battle started before the world began and finally concludes when the earth is cleansed of all evil. The author traced down through the events of Earth's history, showing how mankind has been engaged in an ongoing controversy with God. Then, at the end of the book, the author plunged ahead to the future to unveil the final conflict between good and evil. In 1858, an Adventist published this book, which was entitled The Great Controversy. And who was that author? Ellen White? No! It was a man named Horace Lorenzo Hastings. Many Seventh-day Adventists are stunned when they learn that in 1858 a Sunday-keeping Adventist named H. L. Hastings published a book entitled The Great Controversy Between God and Man, Its Origin, Progress and Termination. Even more intriguing is the fact that the book was published prior to Mrs. White's 1858 vision at Lovett's Grove, in which she supposedly was given a view of the great controversy between good and evil throughout history. What an amazing stroke of coincidence that Ellen White would receive her vision right after H. L. Hastings published his epic book on the great controversy. Mrs. White was purportedly shown a panoramic vision of a great controversy raging between good and evil throughout the annals of human history. Was the timing of these two great controversy events simply mere happenstance? Are they completely unrelated events, as Ellen White loyalists would have us believe? Or could it be that Mrs. White obtained her great controversy theme from Hastings rather than from Visions? To begin our investigation, we must understand that H. L. Hastings was no stranger to James and Ellen White. At this time, the Adventist community was still in its infancy. Leaders such as Hastings were well known throughout the community. In fact, James White's familiarity with Hastings' writings is evidenced by the fact that the Review and Herald published three of Hastings' articles in 1854 and 1855, all of which were later incorporated into Hastings' Great Controversy book. In addition to being familiar with these articles, 
It is also probable the Whites read Hastings' book prior to Mrs. White's great controversy, Vision. On March the 14th, 1858, Ellen White was purported to have had her famous great controversy vision at Lovett's Grove. Interestingly enough, a mere four days later, on March the 18th, 1858, a review of Hastings' great controversy appeared in the Review and Herald magazine, for which James White was editor. While we have no written record of Mrs White reading the book, it is highly likely that she at least read the article in James's review. And from evidence presented later in this chapter, it would appear she was quite familiar with the book itself. In fact, it would have been unusual for her not to have read Hastings' book, being that he was so well known and respected among the early Adventists. It was not long until the Whites had published their own book dealing with the theme of the Great Controversy. In September of 1858, the Whites' rendition of the Great Controversy appeared under the title Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. The third and fourth volumes of Spiritual Gifts appeared six years later in 1864 and expanded upon the 1858 volume. Later, in 1884, these writings were expanded upon further and republished as Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. Finally, in 1888, the book was once again expanded upon and reprinted under the title for which it is known today, Great Controversy. The book was revised a final time in 1911, and it is this version that is sold today in Adventist bookstores throughout the world. While Hastings' book was a mere human production, Mrs White assured her followers that her version of the Great Controversy came straight from God. Quote, The book, The Great Controversy, I appreciate above silver or gold, and I greatly desire that it shall come before the people. While writing the manuscript of The Great Controversy, I was often conscious of the presence of the angels of God, and many times the scenes about which I was writing were presented to me anew in visions of the night, so that they were fresh and vivid in my mind. End of quote. After reading the above statement, any sincere Seventh-day Adventist would be led to conclude that the book was the product of visions and divine guidance by God and his angels. But did Ellen White really receive great controversy through visions? Or was she inspired by H. L. Hastings and others? All serious scholars agree that Mrs. White's book is not a direct plagiarism of Hastings' book. It would, after all, have been a bit foolhardy for Mrs. White to plagiarise a book that was just advertised by James in the Review, a book so many Adventists were no doubt familiar with and had read. Therefore, how can we ascertain whether or not Mrs. White borrowed the ideas of her book from Hastings? White used Hastings' book as a template. While direct plagiarism of Hastings is scant, there is an astonishing similarity in the main themes, the topics and the structure of the two books, including similarities in the introductions and closings. It appears Mrs White followed Hastings' great controversy as an outline or a template in developing her own great controversy, writing upon many of the same topics in the same order. See Appendix 2. One of the most formidable evidences of Mrs White's dependence upon Hastings is the fact that there are instances where Hastings expounds on Bible events, adding his own conjectures that are not found anywhere in the scriptures, and Mrs White incorporates those same conjectures into her inspired writings. For example, Hastings speculates that when the animals entered the ark, the wicked were not impressed at all by that miraculous event. Mrs White picks up the same extra-biblical idea and incorporates it into her version of the event. See Appendix 2 for this and other examples. Improved version of Hastings' book. 
In the review of Hastings' Great Controversy that appeared in the March 1858 review, the author points out that the book is in need of some improvements. James and Ellen would later take it upon themselves to make the necessary improvements to Hastings' book. The review lamented, We could wish he had reminded the revolters, sick, of a certain law that reposes in the ark. Mrs White remedied Hastings' lack of focus on the old covenant law when she published her own version of the great controversy in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. In Chapter 28, The Third Angel's Message, she addresses the importance of the law that resides in the heavenly ark. The review also expressed a wish that Hastings had spent more time, quote, on the points of man's rebellion and the terms of reconciliation, end of quote. Mrs. White made up for these perceived shortcomings when she published Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, which has two chapters dealing with these subjects, Chapter 2, The Fall of Man, and Chapter 27, The Sanctuary. Who else inspired Ellen White? There is no doubt that Mrs. White's version of the Great Controversy differed from Hastings' view. She incorporated Seventh-day Adventism's distinct doctrines and interpretations of Bible prophecy into her book. Are these the parts of the book that came from her Lovett's Grove vision? Well, not exactly. Many of Mrs. White's writings on prophecy found in Great Controversy are a rehash of James White's book, Life Incidents, first published in 1868. Comparisons done by Walter Ray show that, quote, words, sentences, quotations, thoughts, ideas, structures, paragraphs, and even total pages were taken, unquote, from it and put into the 1888 version of Great Controversy. Interestingly, much of the life incidents was taken primarily from J. N. Andrews' 1860 book, entitled The Three Messages of Revelation 14, 6-12, and particularly The Third Angel's Message and The Two-Horned Beast. Walter Ray explains that Ellen White's ideas about unique Adventist doctrines ultimately originated with J. N. Andrews and Uriah Smith. Quote, Andrews had begun to write about his own views of the Great Controversy in the early editions of the 1850 Review and Herald. There, in the 1850s and the 1860s, both he and his brother-in-law, Uriah Smith, advanced the ideas that Adventists came to accept as ideas coming from Ellen White, such as the Sabbath, the Sanctuary, 2,300 Days, Judgment, much of the details of the Second Coming of Christ, the millennium, the mark of the beast, the United States in prophecy, spiritualism as part of last day events and Adventism as the centre of the great controversy and closing events. All of these subjects, as well as others, were written upon in the Advent Review in those early years. End of quote. Thus, most if not all of the prophetic interpretations in great controversy were in place prior to Mrs White's great controversy vision or the writing of her book. There is every indication that the teachings in Great Controversy originated from the studies of J. N. Andrews and Uriah Smith, not from visions. Perhaps these men should be honoured as the real prophets in the SDA sect. While Mrs. White relied primarily on SDA authors for the prophetic section of Great Controversy, she relied on non-SDA authors throughout most of the historical section, it is certainly baffling as to why a prophet who received a vision of an event would need to resort to historical authors for material, but that is exactly what Ellen White did. Her son W.C. gives some insight into this. Quote, when I was a mere boy, I heard her read Deobigne's history of the Reformation to my father. She read to him a large part, if not the whole, of the five volumes. She has read other histories of the Reformation. This has helped her to locate and describe many of the events and the movements presented to her in vision. End of quote. This candid admission from W.C. indicates Mrs. White read the books long before she later copied their content into Great Controversy. 
it should now be evident that most, if not all, of the content for the great controversy came from other authors. Much evidence for this copying has been gathered by Walter Ray and others. A synopsis showing the vast extent of the plagiarism problem is found in Appendix 3. Discovery of Great Controversy Problems As scholarship advanced over the years, more and more flaws were discovered in Great Controversy. Unfortunately, the scholarship of J.N. Andrews and Uriah Smith was not always on target. The mistakes in their writings had crept into the inspired 1888 version of Great Controversy. This presented a problem for the SDA leaders. Errors in such a prominent book, one that had been billed as the product of visions and angels, could not be easily swept under the rug. Foremost in discovering the errors were theology students and professors at the sect's college. W. C. White lamented that the professors and students at Battle Creek College were, quote, bringing into our work questions and perplexities without end and always increasing, end of quote. Behind closed doors, the sect's leaders grappled with the serious problems they were discovering in Great Controversy. Prior to the release of the 1911 version, Professor W. W. Prescott was called upon to review the book. After toiling over the book for a considerable time, he sent W. C. White a lengthy 39-page letter containing suggested corrections and concluded by saying, quote, Allow me to say in closing that it has been quite a shock to me to find in this book so many loose and inaccurate statements, and what I have submitted for your consideration will indicate how much of an undertaking it will be to revise this book so that it will be in harmony with historical facts. End of quote. Yes, it must have been quite a shock for Professor Prescott to discover so many loose and inaccurate statements in a book that was supposedly written out from heavenly visions with the divine assistance of angels. He must have been appalled to discover it was out of harmony with historical facts. While some of Prescott's 105 changes were rejected for unknown reasons, over half were included in the 1911 revision of the book. Thus, Prescott can add his name to a long list of those who supplied material for the book. W. C. White was given the unenviable task of explaining to the sect's followers why a prophet's words were out of alignment with historical facts. He wrote, quote, on pages 50, 563, 564, 580, 581, and in a few other places, where there were statements regarding the papacy which are strongly disputed by Roman Catholics and which are difficult to prove from accessible histories. The wording in the new edition has been so changed that the statement falls easily within the range of evidence that is readily obtainable. End of quote. It is clear from this that the brethren rewriting the book had little confidence in anything Ellen White wrote that was not backed up by an historical document. To avoid future embarrassment for the sect, no vision-inspired history would be carried forward into the 1911 version without historical facts backing it up. Cannot live up to the claims made for it. Great Controversy has been marketed to the flock as a book that was divinely inspired in a supernatural way. In the introduction, we find these startling claims of divine inspiration. Quote, Through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, the scenes of the long-continued conflict between good and evil have been opened to the writer of these pages. As the Spirit of God has opened to my mind the great truths of his word and the scenes of the past and the future, I have been bidden to make known to others that which has thus been revealed, to trace the history of the controversy in past ages. End of quote. Mrs. White makes it abundantly clear that she wrote the book with the aid of angels and visions. Quote, while writing the manuscript of the Great Controversy, I was often conscious of the presence of the angels of God, 
and many times the scenes about which I was writing were presented to me anew in visions of the night, so that they were fresh and vivid in my mind. God gave me the light contained in the great controversy. Events in the history of the reformers have been presented before me. End of quote. These quotations paint the picture of a prophet who received divine visions of the past, present and future and then wrote out those visions in great controversy with the supernatural assistance of angels to guide her. However, the presence of serious errors in the book points to a very different origin. It reveals a prophet who got her inspiration more from other historians than from supernatural sources. Rather than angels helping her, she was aided by J. A. Wiley, Uriah Smith, J. N. Andrews and W. W. Prescott. Rather than witnessing scenes in vision, she viewed them on the pages of other authors' books. Great Controversy, a rehash of others' writings. In 1919, a conference regarding the spirit of prophecy was held among SDA leaders. Behind closed doors, the sect's leaders discussed how great controversy came into being. Quote, B. L. House. As I understand it, Elder J. N. Andrews prepared those historical quotations for the old edition, 1888 Great Controversy, and Brother Robinson and Brother Chrysler, Professor Prescott, and others furnished the quotations for the new edition. Did she write the historical quotations in there? A.G. Daniels, no. W.W. W. Prescott, you are touching exactly the experience through which I went personally, because you all know that I contributed something toward the revision of great controversy. I furnished considerable material bearing upon that question. When I talked to W.C. White about it, and I do not know that he is an infallible authority. He told me frankly that when they got out great controversy, if they did not find in her writings anything on certain chapters to make the historical connections, they took other books like Uriah Smith's Daniel and Revelation and used portions of them. End of quote. Apparently, Sister White had more than God and the angels assisting her. It appears the other brethren in the sect not only supplied her with material, but also incorporated that material into her book. Unfortunately, with all the copying of fallible historians, errors were bound to creep into the book. One example is found on page 272 of the 1888 edition, in which Mrs White writes that the St Bartholomew's massacre began with the tolling of a bell at the palace. Mrs White supposedly heard this bell tolling in a vision. Professor Prescott pointed out that the signal came from an entirely different location. He said it was given by the ringing of the bell in the church of St Germain. After some discussion, the brethren decided the best way to handle this discrepancy was to drop the location from the 1911 edition. In regards to the extent of the copying that took place in the Great Controversy, Dr McAdams stated it best when he announced at the special 1980 meeting of SDA leaders in Glendale, California, quote, if every paragraph in the book Great Controversy written by Ellen White was properly footnoted, then every paragraph would have to be footnoted. End of quote. Even the guardians of Ellen White's reputation, the Ellen G. White estate, has been forced to admit that at least half the book was copied from others. Quote, there was no question in Ellen G. White's mind about the overall inspiration of the great controversy, although possibly 50% or more of the material in the book was drawn from other sources. Purpose of this book Although the introduction to great controversy provides no hint that Mrs. White relied on human sources of inspiration, in recent years, Adventist leaders have admitted Mrs. White borrowed considerable material from other authors. However, we are assured that the Holy Spirit was guiding those efforts. 
While no one would expect great controversy to be infallible or perfect in every detail, one would certainly expect that a book written from visions, with the further aid of angels and the Holy Spirit, would be free from major blunders. Mrs White made grand claims about the inspiration of this book, so we should expect nothing less than an accurate book. One sure way to show that Mrs White obtained her information from others rather than from the Holy Spirit, angels and visions is to highlight the errors in great controversy because presumably angels of God would have alerted her to these errors. Through the remainder of this book, historical errors and theological falsehoods will be examined in detail so that the reader can make an educated decision regarding the inspiration of this book. Conclusion While many find Great Controversy to be a thought-provoking book, it can hardly be considered an original work. All of the major themes in the book were developed earlier and written out by other authors, many of whom were non-Adventists. Considerable material for the book was actually supplied by W. W. Prescott and put together by her book editors. It is difficult, if not impossible, to point to any prophetic or historical fact that actually originated with Ellen White. The few original writings that she put in earlier versions of the book, such as her description of Satan having a physical body, were removed by the time the 1911 version was published. The only conclusion that can be drawn is that if Mrs White did indeed receive a vision at Lovett's Grove in 1858, it contained no new light that had not already been written out by other Adventists and non-Adventists. There is one profound sentence from Hastings' Great Controversy that is not found anywhere in Ellen White's Great Controversy or in any of her other writings. Quote, There is no other light than the word of God. Unquote. Hastings did not believe in a lesser light. He believed in one light, the Holy Bible. As you proceed to the next chapters, comparing the doctrines of great controversy with the Bible and with historical facts, you will better understand the poignancy of his statement. <laughs>